Hello. Is this mic working? Yes. yes. Cool. Right. Um, so where does this talk come from, which is a good place to start? Last year, I did a talk. And the thing I got the biggest question about was that comment there. So I worked for a company called MyEng, not MyEng, I worked for a company called MyEng, I worked for a company called ScholarPack, and we scaled up to microservices. And the talk last year was about how we went to microservices. But what everyone was really interested in is how our big ball of mud actually was a really popular system, and we could not sell it. And so I went away, I thought about it, and I came up with a hypothesis. And every great system I have worked on, every really successful product, has been a festering pile of poo in the back end. And that made me wonder, why were great systems festering piles of poo? So I went back the last few jobs, looked at what it was. So ScholarPack. ScholarPack is, the, well, when I was there, I was CTO. When I was there, it was the fastest growing MIS, so school management system in the country. Schools absolutely love it. I left when there was a bit of a takeover, there was a merger, uh, a rival bought them. They were no longer actively allowed to sell ScholarPack, and still, it was the third highest selling MIS last term. So this system is so popular that people will go and buy it even though they're not allowed to sell it. Why? Well, it was written by a teacher. The teacher who wrote it taught himself to program to write ScholarPack. He was sat in the, he was sat in the, the office of his secondary school, Skegness Grammar, and they were showing him the problems they were having with their system. He goes, I can do better than that. And Gary Saddington, being the man he is, and the strength of will he has, he went home, taught himself Python, learned Zoop. Is there anyone in the room who's ever heard of Zoop? Yay. <laughs> they probably want you. Um, yay. <laughs> it, is this, it, was, it was Django before Django. And he wrote this thing in Zoop over a weekend, and Skeggy Grammar moved to ScholarPack. And from there, it was the first, it was the first system to breach a thousand schools. There was an incumbent called Sims, which was owned by Capita. That was the de facto, was the hoover of schools. So it was the first one really to breach a thousand. It set the way for an entire industry. But in the back end, it's Zoop. If you've never heard of Zoop, imagine PHP 4, but worse. <laughs> it's horrendous. But Head to head, people still want it. People still want to buy it. It is still probably the most feature complete primary MIS that exists because it was written by a teacher for the school. Where I am now, I'm software engineering director for a company called My Energy. And people think we make car chargers. That's a rather lovely car charger um, called Zappy which is the smartest car charger on the market. I have to say that, and contractually obliged. But we are not just a car charger manufacturer. We make smart controls for your home. And we actually started as a thing we call Eddy, which matches the power output from your solar panels and puts it into the heating element in your, in your immersion heater. And it started because Lee Sutton, or Sut Dog as we call him, who was the founder in the previous company went, I'm wasting all this power. It's going onto the grid. They don't pay me enough for it. I'm tight. He's from Grimsby. <laughs> how do I keep hold of my energy? How do I keep hold of it? And there we get the name of the company. But how do I keep hold of this? And so he designed a circuit on his kitchen table that matched the power output of his solar panels and put it into the hot water tank. And the other co-founder, Jordan, who is all sorts of amazing, she said, but well, can we do it with electric cars? And he went, Maybe. And then Zappy 1 was born, which is an electric car charger, which matches the output of your solar panels and puts it into your car. It also works as another, as another um, just normal car charger. And at some point, they were selling, selling it, and a customer said, I want a mobile app. And, went, and not only did you go, I want a mobile app, I will write you a mobile app. So a customer wrote him a mobile app. And they went, OK, I need some data. Well, the only person they had in the business was firmware engineers. Firmware engineers who are proper old school firmware engineers where C++ is an abomination 
And if it's an error, the compiler's probably wrong. And that, that Linux nonsense, that, that's wrong. It, it has to be. Everything's running on bare metal. So firmware engineers wrote a status server, which is literally running on the bare metal of a server. There is no operating system. There is just the code. It is pure beauty. Um, but customers love it. No one else does what my energy do. And the products are amazing. We can't make them fast enough. Our factory makes 3,000 a week now, and we are selling 16 weeks ahead. We've just broken ground on a 75,000 square foot new manufacturing facility, and that will probably be too small when it opens next year. But it is running embedded C on physical hardware. But what they both did is the customer was first. They didn't give a toss about the best design paradigms. No one went, should I be using ECS or Kubernetes? Nobody went, did you know, what language should I use? They just went, what have we got? Papa Sads went, we teach a in the A-level course, we teach Python. And we use Zope. I'll write it in that, because it's already installed. Lee went to Chris, who was the lead firmware engineer, and said, I need a server. And Chris went, I can write you a server. It's OK, it's just a router with more disks. I'll do that. So we end up with these platforms that are big piles of poo, really. But you know what? The customers love them. And I go back to the other companies I've worked in in the last 20 years, because I'm old. So we got, you know, I worked for a company called Dispatch Bay, which had an amazing product. It lets you buy shipping for your products. So it's a really nice platform. That was written because the guy who founded it was selling PCs in his house and goes, I want a way of making buying shipping easier. So he wrote in PHP and off it goes. And that PHP is now one of the most successful companies in Lincolnshire. You know, I work for Barbon Insurance. And the insurance platform there is this god awful ball of Perl, PHP 4, PHP 5, PHP 5.5, all running at the same time. No one bothered re-architecting it. They just added more bits in as they went along. But I, one of my jobs there, I looked at replacing the, the insurance code platform. And we couldn't, because nothing did what that platform did. So the manifesto makes a claim. I love the Agile Manifesto. I, this is why I'm at an Agile conference. This is like, the truth is always in there somewhere. So we say principle nine. Anyone, is that principle nine? Yeah. Continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. Am I saying that's wrong? No, the manifesto is completely right because these are festering balls of poo, which satisfy the customers. But this, this will make your toes curl. It is literally tied to Zope 2.10 running Python 2.4. Because it cannot upgrade, because it is using a feature of Zope that was removed in 2.11 that is so fundamentally ingrained in the platform, you cannot remove it. And if you listen to my talk from last year, there's a whole 45 minutes on what we did to deal with that. But, plug. But it's it is unmaintainable. It is doing things with SQL that Bob would throw things at me for, <laughs> for doing. It literally generates HTML and CSS in the, in the SQL because we had a bigger database than server that was quicker, so it does it. <laughs> Try debugging that at 2 o'clock on a Saturday morning. So that needed to move. This, as wonderful as it is, writing your own t IP stack, and your own database based on flat files in memory and all the other things, it maxed out at about 15,000 users. We pushed it to 20,000 users, which if you actually read the reviews of our mobile app on the App Store, was probably 7,000 users too long to actually get us a good rating at that time. Um, so we've had to rewrite that. And we have to, in rewriting that, we've had to look at the firmware and change the firmware to make it cope more, more seamlessly with the load. Currently, that, the platform that we've moved to is coping with about 75,000 connected homes. And we're selling 3,000 zappies a week. 
So it tells you how quickly that is growing. So next Tuesday, I've got a three-day workshop on the third version of the data server to cope with what is insane loads. So it's important to think that this is the point where companies die. So Scholar Pack, my energy, so Dispatch Bay, Barb and Insurance, I worked for 15 years on Steelworks. If you keep growing at the rate they're growing with the success they had early doors, there comes a point where the systems fall over. It was about 15,000 users for my energy. If you don't do anything, this happens. You will fall, the company cannot grow. It cannot keep up. I've got through this far quicker than I thought, so hopefully this will take the next 15 minutes. <laughs> well, you've got lots of questions. We need to do things. So a laser focus on the user is absolutely vital. These companies grew because they did exactly what the user wants. What you can't do is lose that when you move away from it. So. We started by doing what doesn't scale. Carry on doing that. But make sure that when you do it, you are always having, a, having an eye to the future. You're always thinking about, right, I am consciously now doing what doesn't scale. What you don't want to happen is your Zope 2.10 problem. The thing that, sorry. I'm going to segue a bit now. The thing that annoys me is I talk to lots of companies and they are going around. I'm going to pick on Kubernetes again because it's the latest thing that developers always tell me they want and I keep going. Are you really sure? Everybody thinks they're Google. Everybody thinks they're going to be at zettabyte scale and they're going to be doing amazing things. And actually, what you end up doing is building ridiculous infrastructure that you can't maintain. Job minus two, I was engineering director of the key group, which the company that bought Scholarpack Complex. It, my LinkedIn looks insane. There, somebody went for one of the other products. I don't trust GCP's Redis instance. I'm going to write my own in Kubernetes. We spent four months of having rolling outages because apparently writing a high availability Kubernetes backed Redis instance on your own is quite hard. And it took me falling out with him and somebody else in the board to go, no, just pay the money to GCP and just have them which have a team looking after it which is bigger than your team, to, well, the, probably the entire company just looking after Redis and move to it. So make sure you're not just van doing vanity things because vanity is bad. Make sure you're actually buying what you need to buy and ignoring the fancy technology and just doing the thing that's solid that works now. Because if you architect it right, and all of this is underpinned, I'm assuming here that you've got tests, all levels of tests. If you've got tests and you've got good practice, you can always change. So do the thing that works now and change later. Don't try and be Google tomorrow. Another good one, don't fix what isn't broken. Same team, good God. They decided that they had a massive amount of technical debt. It was a CMS written in Python, um, Wagtail, I don't know. It was a, but, They'd done a lot of work and there was a huge amount of technical debt. And they went, I know we'll alternate a sprint of features and a sprint of technical debt. And I was like, sounds mad. Try it. Those technical debt sprints were the fortnight of hell every second week for sprint. Everything died because you remember the old XKCD with like the entire internet and there's like one random library to this thin twig. 
what they were doing is every fortnight is kicking their twigs out because they go and fix this technical debt, which is working. It is in there. It is functional. It is doing the job day in, day out, not complaining. They go, I don't like it because you're not in using this latest Python library. You're not using this greatest design pattern. You're not, you're not using curry functional programming or whatever it is. So I'm going to change you. And they just push the constraint on the line and the, the, the hose explodes. When I was an electrical engineer, one of my best diagnostic tools was um, a fuse carrier. Have you ever seen a fuse, an industrial fuse carrier? So massive cartridge fuses. So a fuse carrier with a nail in it. And if you couldn't work out what was wrong, you chuck the nail in the hole and let the kit that was, tripped, that was blowing the fuse just blow up. Because you'd find that, the smoke gives it away. <laughs> Fixing what isn't broken is randomly inserting nails into your system. So good luck fixing that. Ooh. My favorite one. Respect your legacy. Your steaming balls of poo are the thing that's making you money. They're the reason the company exists. They're why you have a job. They are what you turn up every day to work on. If they did not exist, you would not be there. And the, it's strange that if we talk about legacy in most other parts of our life, it's a good thing. It's our legacy. It's the thing we're passing forward. The, we talk about legacy code, and we're talking about something that's wrong, something that's broken, something that isn't good. I'm probably one of the few developers under the age of 45 who has actually written Fortran commercially. And I say that to people, and they go, Fortran? Well, it works, it compiles. Most of the steel in this country is made on, in steelworks, they're running, well, some of them still running bloody vaxes, but most of them are on alphas now, or alpha simulators, running open VMS with Fortran. Why Fortran? Well, Fortran was the language you used when you got the PDP-11 out of the box in 1978. And that code has moved forward. If you travel by rail in this country, the rail will be bought in Scunthorpe and it'll be written, it'll be going over, gone to the mills, which are controlled by Fortran that I wrote. So that Fortran does a lot of work. And co good code is good code. Language is irrelevant. And legacy is our legacy. It's what we're taking forward. It's the thing that we have. It's, it's what we need. So, it, this, is, I'm getting, this is turning a real rant now. So it annoys me when I get developers whinging about what they have to work on and whinging what's there because it worked and it was good enough and we know what it does and we still have the code. And if you're a good programmer, you can read Fortran and you can read C and you can read Python and you can read TypeScript. All of it is irrelevant to having a functional program that works. So respect the legacy. Focus on what the customer actually needs and be very clear on who the customers are because your customer is not always the person sat using your product. The thing that made all the companies that I've worked for that have been great, great, is they really, and I keep saying this, really cared what the customer wanted. At Scholarpack, we would throw features out with hours of notice. A school would phone up and go, we've got Offset in, we need it to do this. And back when we were really small, like 200, of, 200 schools, we would just write that. When we got to 1,000 schools, we started going, perhaps you should verify that more than one school wants this, but not much more. Features would ship multiple times a day at Scholarpack. We didn't really have a CI pipeline because Zope. And in fact, there's a long story about why we had to do that because Zope. But we would literally have a school phone in, go, offset are in, we can't see these numbers, we really need these numbers, it needs to work in this way. And we would go off and we would design it, we would work on it, we would ship it, and within an hour sometimes, the school would have a new report or a new part of the system that gave them what they want. And that is why 
they still sell despite the fact that they don't sell. <laughs> the fact that schools are so addicted to a platform that is fundamentally designed to their precise needs means that that product will be in the market for another seven years, easily. The only thing that will kill it is somebody in the key group will go, we can't run two MASs anymore and pull the plug and force everyone to move over. And they'll probably get 50% of the customers not move if they do it. <coughs> that is how sticky it is. The other MIS, as it says with bitterness, that was bought, was designed from technology up. They paid a group of Serbian developers to write a system in PHP because, you know, um, so they started, they started from scratch. So they had a group of developers who didn't know the British education system design an MIS. And shockingly, it didn't sell that well. They also went, one management system will work for all types of school. Whereas Scholar Pack had gone, secondary schools are completely different to primary schools. We'll focus just on primary. And what they've got is, whoop, what they've got is Arbor, and Arbor doesn't really do what a secondary school wants and doesn't really do what a primary school wants. It does sort of both. It doesn't have that laser focus on the user. And its main selling point is it's better than Capita Sims, which is sort of like going, it is better than having my teeth extracted. <laughs> it's, it's no focus on the user. There is just a focus on this market is ripe for the taking if we throw enough money at it, people will come. And it was only when they said, you are not allowed to sell Scholar Pack to the schools, did Scholar Pack stop out selling it. Scholar Pack have hardly any developers. Shockingly, they all work for the, my energy now, it seems. But they, you know, they've sort of condensed and run down, but still it outsells. At the largest, Scholar Pack had 10 developers, whereas Arbor had 50, and still they're outselling it. All because we were focused on that. We were doing what didn't scale, and we weren't fixing things that weren't broken. There's nothing inherently wrong with Zope. There is nothing inherently wrong with the system. It renders web pages. It does its job. We put in fixes to ensure that security was sorted. We, all that was done. We fixed what was broken and put it in place, but maintained the legacy that was there because the legacy was built from years, a decade of school feedback. Every good talk needs a Laplace quote. <laughs> Never let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And if you've ever been in any of my meetings or one of my teams, you will hear me say that probably at least once an hour. <laughs> because as developers, we have an, a habit of looking for the best. We, 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 try to, we try to optimize. We try to make sure we've got the perfect framework, the perfect language, the perfect operating system, the perfect tool, the perfect everything. You know, is that algorithm running within as quickly as it can? But we need the perfect to be there as a goal but we, we're good enough is usually good enough. And, and good enough with a customer is better than the perfect on the drawing board. So, and finally, I'm hoping you've got some questions. <laughs> Have a plan, not a big Gantt chart with lines on it and, and you know, your route to taking over the world and dominance because it will be wrong. But you can't do the rest of these things unless you have a direction of travel. What is the next thing? What is the biggest pain point in the system that we have to fix? If I'm going to work on, to, this is a very scholar pack heavy talk and my energy slide in, but if we're going to work on the student record, then what, what are the things, what I'm in there, I need to fix? What's the next techno, ne uh, technological move? What is what is my move with databases? I mentioned to Bob earlier that Scholar Pack had one major design problem over there that really impacted us when we were looking at it, which is every school in Scholar Pack 
had its own database on Postgres. Every single database requires its own connection, which is great when there's 300 schools. When you reach 2,000 schools, every user is spawning a connection to the database, and suddenly you run out of connections on your Postgres server, not because of the load, just because that you need to have, for 2,000 schools, probably 10,000 active connections, maybe 20,000, <laughs> because every teacher's coming in, all these processes. We needed a plan. So the, on, on the plan, which never actually got executed, was a, was a, if we want to do this step, we need to move to per, a schema per school rather than a database per school. Back him over to, you know, what's broken if we do that? What, what does that scale for us? All these other things interplayed, but we're knowing that we can't increase this unless we do that is vital. And doing that thinking in advance means that it never comes as a shock because most of these things end up happening because you arrive at it all of a sudden. Because one day you go, somebody, I don't know, go to my energy. We've, we sell in Australia and somebody turns around to us and goes, we now need to have an Australian instance, which may or may not be a thing that I'm looking at. Without considering that, we suddenly are in this, just rip everything down, throw it up, build it. Linux for you, I should have run caffeinate. Um, but having the plan means now we, we know that when we go regional, we know what steps we need to take, we know what's broken. When, when the CEO comes to me and goes, we want to start doing this, I can go, right, we need to consider this, 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 and this. We need to take, this needs to be a project. Without that, I get, with go, doing this, I'll go, okay, I'm sure we can make it work, and then off I, I trot. So, always have, I've done it in book after, but always have a little P plan. Always know what your next step will be. And always, always focus on the customer needs. Um, if you want to meet, see me, then all my uh, contact details are there. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, when future-proofing your team's code specifically, because you mentioned languages and code a lot, um, what's the company-wide strategy and what's your part in that? What, what's your decision-making process? Uh, company, no, that's a, that, that's a very interesting question. So, my energy... <laughs> so, so, my energy, you've only had a software engineering division for about a year. So, I've been there one year. When I started, I was employee 68 of the company. There is now 400 of us in my energy, and the software team's gone from me to, to um, I think there's 40 of us now between various teams. So we've scaled a lot. The thing that we haven't quite got hold of is how do, does my world interact with the firmware world? So from our point of view, we have, we have good standards because I I've, I've more or less went and I handpicked a team of people to come in and help me grow it may or may not have come from ScholarPack. Um, we went, right, these are our standards. This is what we do. This is how we grow. This is how you do branching. This is how you do versioning. The thing we are now running up against is how do the firmware teams work? And the firmware teams are, they've got a lot more gray in their beard than me, lots of them. And there's a lot more, it, they, they've usually come I would say the wrong way, but I'm an electrical engineer, so the same way as me. So they've probably come from the hardware into the firmware rather than having engineering practice. Uh, I have got a lot of sessions over the next couple of months. My calendar is insane where we're looking at introducing things like TDD to the, to the firmware teams. We're looking at um, build frameworks. We've recently transitioned all of our products from a PIC processor to a TIE ARM architecture, so which allows us to do things like run virtualized, virtualized versions of our firmware. And we're using that to try and push some of our, our practices from software. So we you know having CI builds, having various different, you know, 
the things that we all take for granted probably working in software, which is, oh, I got a unit test. Well, I mentioned unit tests and the vendor comes in and try to sell us a 10,000 pounds a seat automated testing thing, which would analyze it and everything else. And it's like, well, there's this thing called Unity over here. That looks pretty good. And that's, for that, you can pay for a lot of testing and a lot of training. So we, we're pushing those conversations. We're trying to get our software practice down into the product. Bear, trying to bear in mind that they've got this, no, they're worse than us because the firmware on the devices is the special source. And that's something that we need to keep. We need to make sure that our firmware carries on having these fantastic features and we don't lose that innovation that we have. Thanks. Um, my second question is very short. Um, what's your preferred programming, uh, programming language? <laughs> I like Python uh, because it's, it, does, it, it goes from very little to very big. Um, I, I, apparently, I'm in the minority when I go to most companies and say I want to write in Python, but I, I love Python. So. <laughs> Thanks very much. Really enjoyed the talk. Um, a lot of the fantastic points you made on the couple of slides ago, um, are all, they all seem like really brilliant suggestions, but it's also the exact opposite of how so many developers that I know like to operate. So how do you, how do you convince them to do these things? Um, slowly, and you go and watch Kerry's talk back um, on, uh, on giving feedback. Now, these are all practices. They're all things you do over time. They're not, you're right, they're not natural behaviors because you all want to build a Kubernetes cluster until you've built a Kubernetes cluster and then you never want to touch that again. You know, and you all want to do, you all want to build the perfect, which is why I have that quote on the wall because I suffer from it more than anyone else. I mean, when did, I've whapped through these slides in 30 minutes. Every time I've practiced them, it's taken me 45. Uh, and I was refining what was on there this morning. I was sat in a talk doing another one earlier. I always want to make things better. I always want to make things perfect. So it's always, ha it's being a good team. It's, when, it's asking, why are you working on that? What are you doing? Why are we changing on it? You know, when somebody's suggesting code and you're getting, um, there's a long rant about why I don't like pull requests, but that's another thing. But when you're looking at a pull request or some code coming in, ask why they've changed something that isn't actually part of the mainline code. Make it a team, decision about what you're doing. Hopefully you've got tests, hopefully you're doing CI, hopefully you've got all those safety nets. But always be asking why have you, why have you changed something that doesn't need to be changed? Why have you chosen the most expensive technology here? Why have you gone for the shiny new framework? I mean, I am a Python fanboy. I have got projects running on this laptop in fast API because that's the latest hotness with all the pedantic models and all everything else. If I was starting a Flask, pro sorry, start a Python project, I'd be putting Flask in production because no matter how good that latest thing is, I would go for the solid thing in production. And it's having the mindset as a team to ask why, why have you, and sometimes I might go, actually, this is a low cost service, this looks really good. It's a cheap way of us trying it out. So we're going to do a fast API service. This has turned into a Python talk, thank you very much. But, but no, it, it's that always question. Hello, um, really good talk, really enjoyed it. Um, I have a question, we have similar challenge in the company that I work for, um, and we have some legacy, but a product that everybody, you know, the customers love. Um, uh, I, one of the challenges we have faced is recruiting uh, for, uh, you know, that kind of legacy stack. And I know that, you know, you mentioned there as well that people sometimes say, well, why should I work with, you know, out of date technology? And I'm wondering what challenges have you faced in that area and how you um, kind of um, dealt with them? Um, try hiring a Zope developer. I found one. <laughs> You're coming with me. <laughs> but yeah, when I started at Scholarpack, so I, I, when I started, they were on 200 schools and I was brought in to replace the founder who wanted to, basically, he, yeah, you don't want him in charge of your technology. 
Um, and their advert said, ZOAP. Didn't have Python, it had ZOAP on there. And they couldn't hire anyone. So the development team I inherited was, was the brother-in-law of the head of sales who was doing a part-time degree in computer science and a support somebody from support who showed a bit of aptitude with code. She is now one of my senior devs, actually, at my energy, and she's awesome, but that's an aside. And a guy who they got talking to at a charity shop. That, that was the dev team because you couldn't hire. So one of the things we did is we, we revamped it. So we, we lied on it. You know, we used Python, which is similar to PHP. We just padded the adverts <laughs> with keywords to get people to be interested. And then we sold the platform. Because you, know, you might notice that I've gone from working in schools to working in green energy. I mean, my energy has this massive thing around we want to optimize your home energy usage. There is a point to this, don't worry. There, there is a, we want to make it so that your home can be as green as it can be. You make the best energy choices. As we get more of these time of use tariffs coming in, as we get more of these interesting things about balancing the grid, um, because as we get more renewables on the grid, bad things happen if we can't match the load to it. So a huge amount of the work we do at My Energy is actually around shifting your usage. And it has, for the consumer, it has the benefit of reducing your carbon, fo your carbon footprint and potentially reducing costs so we can try and save you money on your energy bill. And for the country, it means you don't have rolling blackouts and we all have power, which is quite a nice thing to happen. So I sell that to people. I go, and, so, and Scholar Pack, we are, we are saving children from sexual abuse. We are saving, we are helping that child with autism achieve its, his output, his outcomes. We are literally doing these things for the social good. And that is what I pushed. More than anything else, all of my adverts are around how you're going to make a change in the world. And my energies, the, the God, we've got platforms in TypeScript, we've got some in Python, because I've turned up. We've got some in, um, this, some in C++. We've got a little bit of Go, which is going, not because I don't like Go, but there is just too many languages. Um, so we've got all, all the C Sharp. We've got Postgres and SQL Server. We've got Windows Servers, because until this point, they just paid companies money to deliver things. Luckily, they all chose React. That's like, I'm, I'm not even a big fan of React, but at least they all chose the same one but no one was controlling it. So we have this spread. And if I want to go out and hire TypeScript developers, the first day I think they're broken as people, but that's just me. Um, but there's this, you know, if you turn up expecting to be doing TypeScript and then, oh, here's some C sharp, it's the wrong mindset. So we go out and go, what, this is the vision. And a good developer, in my opinion, is a good developer. Language is irrelevant. Language is a thing you use to express your will. It is pointless going that, no, I'll make funny jokes about PHP. I've written big systems in PHP. I've written big systems in Fortran and C. I think last time I, I did one of these things where you list all the languages you've done, I got to 38 different languages I've touched because I come from an electrical engineering background and you program in the thing that it turns up with. <laughs> and you just do it. Language is irrelevant. Sell the vision, sell the goal, sell where it is going. And if you have one of those, sell that as well. We know it's bad, but we want to do better. And we have these technologies we want to be bringing in. The plan to get rid of this is this. We're doing this, what's the name of that testing, that thing that Emily did yesterday? Yeah, no, we're bringing in approval testing. This is, we're going to do all this amazing approval testing stuff. That's coming through. Just sell the, the vision of what's coming in the future. And then it becomes a retention problem because if you've lied, they'll all leave. So all you need to do is tell the truth and then get them through. Did that help? Uh, well, what wasn't in your talk was if you're faced with um, a steaming pile of poo, would you not? rewrite it and recreate it in a like start again do a big rewrite or how have you had have you had success with that or not that was in that was in there i forgot and i lost the slide actually there we go thank you um i have only seen that fail only seen it. i have only seen it fail so which is I'm, I'm, this is my this is my truth you can tell you tell me yours but when i've gone out and i've there was a job between Scholar Pack and My Energy I do not speak of because I was there for two months and I went, and that was working for one of Scholar Pack's rivals, 
a company called Juniper Education, and they have bought most of the assessment platforms in the country, another MIS, and some various other pieces. And their plan, so I joined there 18 months, two years ago, and I lasted two months. And when I joined, they were rewriting all the assessment platforms to be one assessment platform. And they were rewriting the MIS. And I was speaking to the, the technical architect who has just left, and they still haven't got them live. They still haven't worked, and the customers are still buying what is there. Because there is a problem with a rewrite, in my opinion, which is people turn up and they go, oh, you're rewriting it. We can make it do X now. And they start putting more and more features in. And what comes out the other end is a different product. And that is a product that they can't sell because the other one everyone loves. And there's a fantastic example, a Classroom Monitor, which is one of the assessment packages inside Juniper. Before Juniper bought them, they had a massive user base. And they decided that they needed to move off .NET, whatever they were on, and re rewrite it in C-sharp and do all this other stuff. And so they rewrote it, and they did all this feature creep. And every customer they migrated to the new platform bought a rival product because they didn't understand what in the old product that they thought was sharp edges and didn't work was the thing that made everyone want to keep it. So you can, you can rewrite. So ScholarPack, there's not much soap left in it. We rewrote most of it but we, triggered broom, we triggers broomed it, if you understand the, the reference. We swapped the head and we swapped the handle multiple times. So we rewrote ScholarPack, but we did it a little bit at the time and we ate it from the outside in. So, and only doing the things that were broken, the things we need to do. So we've got a project coming in this area. We'll start by making a feature, an exact feature copy of what's there, and there is an entire talk from last year on this, um, around what's going in there, and then, we will, and then we'll iterate on it. That is what we're doing at my end with the data servers. It has to process the things in the same way, so the APIs will stay stable. And we've taken a lot of pain to make it look exactly the same from the outside, and only changing the bits of it we need to change. Because otherwise, you end up with this, oh, whilst you're in there, do this. So I, never, I will never, ever stand behind a rewrite, even though I'm rewriting things. <laughs> I think we'll wrap it up there. Uh, Gareth, I had such a good time. Thank you so much. Love that talk. Um, yeah.